you will, turn back in your Bibles to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. I do want to say to all of our live stream family, it's good to have you out with us today. And I want to echo what my elder said to all of you mothers. We love you dearly. We love you fondly with the greatest of affection. We thank God for our mothers and we could go on at length about the blessing and benefit of your uh, purpose in our lives. But as our elders said it so succinctly, without our mothers, we wouldn't be here. And so we thank you. Hope you enjoy this Mother's Day. Be safe, be rested, and uh, enjoy uh, the uh, measured solitude that you've been called to. We're going to be looking at Sardis twice, today and next week, because even though it's one of the smaller uh, portions of our Lord's uh, discourse to them in terms of just about six verses, the content is rich enough for us to break it up into two parts. Anytime I'm working through the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, and particularly the seven churches, what I always find myself struggling with in a good way is really wanting to separate the promises of God from his presentation and from him addressing the problems. We learned that the three categories of how he deals with chapters uh, with the seven churches is he comes with his presentation, his placard, the manifestation of his attributes relative to our needs. Then he does his diagnosis. He lets us know uh, where we are the good things and the difficult things, and that's a good father, that's a great shepherd, that's a loving savior. He is not in existence to make us feel good. He's in existence to make us be good. And uh, he bought us for that purpose, and so he will deal with us. But when you come to the promises of God, and this is just the problem I have with being able to see the big picture of the book of the Revelation, all of the promises of God from the promises given to Ephesus all the way through Laodicea are promises that have to do with the citizenship of the people of God in the New Jerusalem. They have to do with our citizenship of the people of God in the New Jerusalem and how that Christ is constantly seeking to maintain our optimism about our part in the kingdom of God in spite of what we're going through down here. Uh, the way our text actually has its theological trajectory uh, in uh, the, uh, the church at Sardis is really for us to be able to understand what it means to be forward thinking, what it means to keep our eyes, as you heard it so eloquently put forth on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for our Lord and Savior. And that also becomes the struggle, does it not? That while we're on this earth and while we're in this world, sometimes we forget or fail to realize that we are not of the world. And because of that, that tension, we find ourselves collapsing into patterns and behaviors that Christ has to address in order that we might not collapse into what happened to many in national Israel. Because we are passing through a wilderness Many of them wanted to go back. And what Christ is doing for his, his latter Jerusalem, his body of believers, is to help us understand that looking back, going back, thinking backwards is not healthy for you. And so as we deal with the church at Sardis in two parts, today we'll be working through verses 1 through 3. Um, the title of our message today is Wake Up. And that's kind of an evasive term, but I, I do want you to get it. The idea of waking up here has to do with startling you out of, again, a kind of stupor of behavior that we can gradual, gradually and imperceptibly slip into. We can fall asleep. And in falling asleep, we can operate out of patterns that we are not as conscious of as we ought to be. And so... One of the most instructive takeaways that you and I get from our Lord's addressing these seven churches is 
what's important to him. So when you're reading and hearing an exposition on these seven churches, think about this. What is our Lord saying in to these seven churches that's important to him? Because largely what you and I do, we measure uh, how, a, how good a thing is by how important it is to us. But with the seven churches of Asia Minor, what you get to do is see how it's important to Jesus Christ. And when he comes and he makes his assessment, he says what he says, he's showing you how he evaluates us based on what's important to him. And what's important to Christ ought to be important to us. And so I say that because with John, there are three critically important spiritual qualities that, uh, that he has taught that are essential to a real saving knowledge of God and a vital witness to the world of that invasion of grace that has come into our lives. The grace of God has impacted our lives. And if it has, there are three qualities that John, from the Gospel of John through the epistles of John, and even now in the revelation that is written by John, three qualities that John has always been concerned about. The first is the quality of faith. John has always been concerned with the people of God understanding the nature of faith, the quality of faith, the assurance of faith, and the benefits of faith. First John chapter 5 verse 1. You guys have heard it before, <clears throat> but listen to it again as it's stated. Whosoever is believing that Jesus is the Christ is already born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten. John drives home saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the grounds of the believer's hope and confidence. For without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. So John nurtures faith in the, uh, in the fifth chapter. The other category that John also nurtures and is important to him and us is love is love. Chapter 4 lays it out. We have seen it so many times. Look at chapter 4, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. This is almost an inclusio, quite frankly. It says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. If any man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him that he who loves God loves his brother also. And of course, you guys know, John is the one by whom God laid out that major placard, which everyone in the universe knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The quality of faith is critical to the believer. The presence and quality of love is essential. Faith works by love. And you and I know we struggle with faith. You also know, if you're honest, you struggle with love. And yet those two qualities are attributes of God that exist in Christ and therefore must exist in the believer as well. And we really do weigh out our, uh, our spiritual health around those two qualities. Because when I'm struggling with my faith, I'm in trouble. And when I struggle with my love, I'm in trouble. And I need to be in trouble because God is love. And so John deals with that critically and, and succinctly, but here's the quality that's going to lead us into our study today. It's the word zoe, or life, life. The three essential qualities that John deals with in 1 John, and then in the book of Revelation, and here in our placard study, in our, our study at Sardis, is the issue of life, life. 
That's what John deals with. He deals with it in all of his, his writings. But if you look at chapter 1, verse 1, notice what it says in 1 John chapter 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes and which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Notice, life is a person. That person is Christ. John says, we have seen him and we have touched him, we have heard him and we have handled him. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son Jesus Christ. For John, life is critical. For Jesus, he made it very clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father but by me. What is life? It is an essential attribute of God. God is the true and living God. Now, what does this have to do with anything? It has to do with everything because you and I have been called to be witnesses of God. We've been called to be uh, witness, witnesses bearing record that we are children of the living God. And if we're children of the living God, there must be evidences of vital faith. If we're children of the living God, there must be evidences of essential divine love pulsing through the veins of our spirit. And if we're children of the living God, we must have the evidence of life. Life. And that is exactly what the master has come to the church at Sardis to address. A very problematic issue of human beings who have had the privilege of being uh, children of the living God somehow collapsing into that which ends up being less than real, authentic life in Jesus Christ. There's a reason he opens up with the placard very clearly in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 with these words. And let's begin to kind of think through carefully and succinctly what we are talking about here unto the church. Uh, in Sardis, write these things, saith he, that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Stop right there. He opens up and he reveals to the church at Sardis two characteristics, two attributes, two fundamental articles that we have seen in the whole panoply of Christ back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 14 through 16. Those two qualities, saints of God, are laid out as he who has or he who possesses the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. On the one hand, the seven spirits of God. On the other hand, the seven stars. What is he doing with this imagery? He's reminding the church at Sardis that their call as a witness to the glory of God in Christ is critically, essentially dependent upon their collaboration with the seven spirits of the living God that gives life to those stars. See, the way that Christ is laying this out is he's reminding us, as he did with the church at Ephesus, that we are the menorah. We are the seven golden candlesticks. We are the seven golden candlesticks that he walks in the midst of. And those seven golden candlesticks are designed to be vital means of the revelation of the glory of God in Christ to the world. You and I are called to be lights in the world. We are called to be shining lights in the world. And the rulers in the church are called to be, as it were, means by which the lights stay lit, by which the menorah stays lit. And the menorah only stays lit by the ministry of the word of God and the preaching of the gospel and the teaching of Christ in the midst so that every candlestick, every individual believer and every local church is experiencing, watch this now, the anointing of the spirit of God that pours into the candlestick that necessary life from God by which we illuminate to the world who God is in us. What Jesus does is he reminds the church at Sardis that it is he who gives them life. They don't give themselves life. And it's he that sustains the life of the people of God. Point number one, the spirit and truth of the gospel. 
to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things said he that has the seven spirits of God. Where did you see that term before? You saw it in chapter one. Where did you see it again in Revelation chapter five, verse uh, verse uh, six and seven, where Jesus is said to be the lamb with seven horns and seven eyes, and the seven eyes are the seven spirits of the living God. But this is, this is Zacharian language. This is the language of Zachariah. This is where Zachariah showed us this beautiful imagery of two olive trees on either side of the menorah, pouring oil into the menorah so that it can be lit. This is the language of Revelation chapter uh, 6, verse 6, and then Revelation chapter 6, verse 11. Look with me first of all at Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and let me just lay this concept down. Jesus is painting the picture to those who would see it. Basically, he's saying that the church at Sardis has a problem with a loss of power, a loss of resource by which it remains illuminated. And that picture, that vivid picture of the collaboration between the candlesticks and the, the two olive trees is critical to see. Here's what he says, and I want us to work all the way through verse 6 so that you guys can see the placard. And the angel t that talked with me came again and waked me up as a man that is awakened out of the sleep. There's a correlation. And he said unto me, what do you see? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick, all of gold and a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps. There it is. Seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it. One upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. And I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Now, uh, Zechariah is seeing articles that he has known and grown up with in his own culture. Olive trees are everywhere in the promised land. And the menorah was a common concept in the temple of the living God. The actual menorah was hid away from the common people, but pictures of the menorah were everywhere in Israel. Everyone knew about a menorah. When they would worship privately in their own homes, Hanukkah, they would know that Hanukkah refers to the perpetual light that shines in the menorah, pointing to the supernatural power of God to keep his people as lights in this dark world. He would have known that. But what Zechariah really was asking was, what does this mean? What does it mean that these two great olive trees are pouring into these lamps and they're being lit. And the instruction here is going to be important to our working through these three verses. Look at what it says over in verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord. What is the vision? The vision is the word of the Lord. What you see, the vision that you see is the word of the Lord. This is one of the genres that the prophets use, visions and dreams and similitude and pictures and parables and types. Here's the word of the Lord. When you see that vision of the two olive trees and the lamps and the correlation between the two, what are you saying, Lord? Here's the answer. Listen to it. He's saying, he answered and spake unto me, this is the word of the Lord, Zerubbabel, unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might nor by power, but what? By my spirit, saith the Lord. What Zechariah was reminded of is that the people of God can't do anything without God. That what Zechariah is being reminded of, and also the church at Sardis, and you and I will be today, is that it is critically important that you and I don't find ourselves disconnected from the source of the light for which we have been called to be a witness to the world. That you and I must constantly walk in dependence upon and consistent longing for the reality of the power of the Spirit and of God to keep us alive and vitally manifesting that witness to which we have been called. Go back to our text now. Let's work this through. Subpoints A, B, and C are simple. The spirit and truth of the gospel is the way that God works in our world. This is fundamentally a collaboration. The oil is essential. That's what Zechariah is being told by the angel. Angel, The lamp is instrumental. 
Revelation chapter 1 verse 12 tells us that Christ is walking through the seven golden lampstands. In Revelation chapter 2, 5, again, the church at Ephesus is being reminded that he is the one that walks through the lampstands. And he's the one that, if you're not careful, remember what he said to the church at Ephesus? If you don't repent and do your first works over, I will what? Remove your candlestick. So when we're talking about the olive trees and the lampstands and the stars, please understand this. The stars have no relevance. The candlestick has no relevance. They have no work to do. There's no significant testimony without the olive trees. Without the spirit of God, there's nothing accomplished. And with that said, what Christ would have that church in Sardis to be aware of is that there is a very uncanny thing that occurs when churches get older and have had now a legacy of testimony and work behind them, which sometimes can cause that local church to collapse into a kind of uh, complacency of reputation by which they live now on the fumes and the residual of what they did in the past versus what it really means to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And that is really what Christ, I believe, is dealing with the church at Sardis uh, uh, expressly about and what you and I want to make sure that we clearly get from the lesson today. Be very careful, child of God. Be very careful that you and I understand what our, our New Year's theme is all about. Second Corinthians 6, 1 makes it very, very clear. We beseech you that you do not receive the grace of God in vain, but that you and I be co-laborers together with God. Co-laboring together with God. That's not an option. There's nothing getting done of any supernatural benefit in the life of anyone if God's not with us. If God's not working in me, if he's not working in you, if he's not working in us, the lights are not on. And if the lights are not on, the life is not there because the light and the life are synonymous metaphors. Y'all know your Bible enough to know that Jesus is the light of the world and he is the light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. Light and life are synonyms. And so as we are looking at Sardis, something happened in Sardis that didn't happen in Thyatira, didn't happen in uh, Pergamos, didn't happen in uh, Smyrna, didn't happen even in, in uh, Ephesus, even though Ephesus, what I would say, come the closest to the parallel with Sardis, meaning Ephesus was in trouble in that it what? Began to lose its what? First love. And at the foundation of faith is love. And the ground and source of any real love has to be life. Has to be life. And now the church at Sardis is coming up against a revelation, a startling revelation from God himself to let them know that they have misjudged their own spiritual status. They have totally misjudged their own spiritual status. Otherwise, why would Christ say it? Listen to these stinging words that will now begin to be the grounds of us taking on some practical principles before we close today. Here's what he says. I know your works. And he doesn't go on with a litany of good things. He says, here's the work that I know about you. You have a name that you are alive. But you're dead. Now, how bad can a person miss that diagnosis? How serious is it for you to believe that you're actually alive and yet the only one that can actually tell you the true condition of your heart is Christ? And how serious is it that he should come to that church and do so? Out of his love, he's letting that church know that somewhere along the lines of the history, it has exchanged the reality of the present vital need for the true and the living God to be the, to be the essence of their identity. And they have bought into some spurious standard as to what it means to be alive, a false standard. Now, we have that in history. We have that in life. You will meet people who have a reputation. And those individuals who have a reputation 
will have outlived their reputation. And now they are what you never heard this term before, but maybe you have. They are nothing but a shell of themselves. You will meet people who of whom you will have heard all kind of feats in gold, sports and business and everything. And they will be in your own mind because of the rhetorical data given some great person. And then when you meet them in person, you know, is this the person that we read about over here? What I'm looking at here doesn't even remotely correspond to what I saw back there. See, this is what we call now history putting on a facade of present. This is what, what we would call an individual who is living out of reputation and not the reality of things with which that reputation uh, uh, alleged that they are. When you see a person who is simply a shell of themselves, you, you get a, an alarm in your soul about the danger of us wasting time in the world and then dissipating as we get older and collapsing into a kind of vanity that ultimately frightens us because that individual is no longer what they appear to be. And what becomes even worse with that individual is if they purport to be what they were, at the moment that they really are not. If they are purporting to be alive, but in fact are dead, what becomes even more alarming is that they don't know that they are not what they used to be. And that's exactly what Christ is saying here. Point number two, for me to underscore this truth, a reputation alone is not reality. A reputation alone is not reality. There's a few lessons we want to get out of this. I've taught this before, as you know, and I always uh, enjoy this lesson, although it grips me, because, again, if you understand the grammar well in our text, the Lord Jesus Christ has pulled back the veils and shown the church at, at Sardis things that they did not actually know were going on. A reputation alone is not reality. Sub point A, this is so very clear. Living in the past is not living. Living in the past is not living. Listen to how Solomon puts it in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 10, of which Solomon said, it is not wise for you and I to be stuck in the past. Listen to how he puts it in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 10. He says, it is not good for us to say the former things, the former things are better, the former days are better than these. It is not good to have that attitude. Say not what is the cause that the former days were better than these, for you do not inquire right wisely concerning this. Have you ever met people who are enamored by and infatuated with yesterday? who are always talking from the standpoint of the past, who are always operating out of, man, do you remember? And listen, there are benefits to get out of the past, as we will see in the moment. But if you meet a person who doesn't have the comfort zone of living in the present, you know that they are either running from something or have been distracted by something and they are not willing to deal with reality as it is in the moment. You come up across people with whom you haven't seen in many, many years and you are the same age, you are peers and you have a brief conversation and you listen to them talk and out of that two minute or five minute conversation, they never say anything about any immediate, relevant, uh, life uh, uh, applauding experiences that they have. They're immediately going back to what happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Well, according to the word of God, that's not how you and I are to be living. You and I are not to be stuck in a kind of uh, showcase cabinet of what happened 10 years ago or what happened 20 years ago. That is a de denial of the reality of the present tense form of what it means to be living right now. The true and the living God is a very present God, a very present help, a very present reality. Now, like I said, and we'll touch on this in a moment, it's all right to understand history for what it is, but history is in the past tense because you and I are called to be going somewhere. Going somewhere, and you ought to live like it. 
Here's the thing that I also know if you don't recognize it in terms of some of the sociological uh, uh, pathologies that exist in our world. You meet very few people who talk in a future oriented sense. You meet very few people who have a very optimistic view of the future. You meet very few people who live in the joy of expectation and the optimism of what they're looking forward to tomorrow. And that is a shame for a child of a living God. For the child of the living God should bubble up and flow over with joy unspeakable and full of glory about what tomorrow has promised them. What tomorrow has promised them. A reputation alone is not reality. Solomon said it's not wise for you to be stuck living in the past. Sub point B, looking backwards while going forward is a denial of faith. Looking backwards while going forward is a denial of faith. Now, again, I understand how propositions work. When you utter a proposition, it's not always omni-conceptual. There are categories of truth that need to be taken into consideration. But at face value, accept this for a moment. You cannot go forward in any healthy, safe way with your head on backwards. You cannot be going forward with clarity of your goal, clarity of your point of termination, clarity of your objective with your head backwards. It would indicate on an anatomical level that you are in conflict with yourself. If I always see the person looking backwards and not forward, then I'm kind of stuck like Lot's wife. When God in his sovereign providence had chosen that rebel lot who was chosen in Christ but lived a life that was so checkered and so dubious and yet because of the sovereignty of God making sure that the trajectory of his goal was glory. The sovereignty of God swept that man up in his choice of rebellion and delivered him from the natural consequences of him going to hell and put him back on a trajectory forward. And he gave him the liberty to tell everybody in his house, we're going forward. We're Hebrews. We're headed to the promised land. We're just passing through. We're pilgrims here. You don't cast a stake down here. At any given time, the heavens will open up and fire and brimstone lava to come down on the culture around you. You better have your bags ready to go because the angel will let you know when you're a child of God, I'm about to burn this place up. It's time for you to move. And Lot started moving and trying to tell everybody in the house we got to go. But what he discovered to his surprise, because of his carnal choices, that the vast majority of them were not elect. They were not pilgrims and strangers. They did not enjoy the idea of moving forward. I'm trying to teach you something. They didn't enjoy the idea that for people that are headed somewhere, we keep our bags packed. And we're ready to move. And I'm not ashamed of the fact that I'm going to have to encamp in this world 42 times until I cross over into the promised land. I'm not ashamed of it. Just not ashamed of it. This ain't my home. And so if the angel warns me and the Lord doeth nothing but that he warns his servants first. And it's time for me to get on up and get out just like we're learning in the book of Revelation. Christ told the disciples when you see the abomination that make it desolate standing in the holy place. Get out of there. And they got out in the first century, too. And they turned and looked back as the fire of God's judgment was coming down on Palestine. And they said, thank you, Lord, for warning us. Speak, Lord, because your servant is listening. And this is the thing that Christ is doing here in our text as well. Living in the past is not living. Looking backwards while going forward is a denial of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the substance of things hoped for. Future-oriented faith is always hoping. The doctrine of hope drives us to a reality that we have not arrived yet, because if we have arrived, we are no longer operating out of hope. So hope wakes you up sometimes in the middle of the night and tells you, hey, you settled on your leaves. Shake yourself, child of God. Wake up, child of God, because this is not your home. All these troubles surrounding you, you know how we get into trouble. And then we want to immediately say, Lord, why are you bringing all this trouble in my life? I kind of like the way things are. Right? I didn't finally settle down. 
Finally got my garden planted. Finally got my bills paid. Finally making a few dollars in the bank. And then here come trouble. And he didn't, he'll, he'll, he'll empty your bank account out. You find yourself back on your camel having to ride again, and you're thinking that God is mad with you. No, God is simply keeping his promise because he called you to be a pilgrim and a sojourner in this world. And he actually knows that right where you are and you happy about it, you happy about it. It's not good for you. It's not good for you. It's not good for you. This is why I think some of y'all know like I know. I, I know you know like I know. I know you know this. That the God that we serve just don't let us get happy, contented too long down here. He just don't. He just don't let us get happy, contented. I just be knowing, I be like knowing in the depths of my soul, it's coming. It's, I'm feeling good. I'm enjoying it. But it's coming. It's coming from somewhere. I'm trying to hear it. I want to see it. And then lo and behold, there it is. I say, see, I knew it. I got five years of vacation. I got 30 weeks. I got six months of reprieve. And then here it goes again. And it's time to keep it moving. And there are some lessons we just need to grasp around this. Look at some point B. Let me teach you a historical lesson. Looking backwards while going forward is a denial of faith. And, 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 and it brings us into the conflict that, as I just stated, Lot's wife had because she got turned into a pillar of salt. All she had to do was keep it moving. But it was not intrinsic to her, and I'm going to talk about why in a moment. But there is a very good historical account that you and I need to know. Uh, God has, from the beginning of the Bible to right now, been moving his people. They just move. There's moving people. And the trajectory of redemptive purpose is that you and I are on a spectrum going somewhere, and all the people have been. The children of Israel... Uh, found themselves in the land of Babylon because of their disobedience, because they neglected the property that they were uh, inherited in the promised land, and they got kicked out. And for 70 years, they were in Babylon, as you know. But after 70 years, God called them back home. And they came back home, and God told them, as we're going to really dig and work through in Daniel 9, to rebuild, reestablish, restore, uh, re, uh, reestablish your witness in the world. And boy, they came back and they saw how devastated the promised land was. Devastating. Now see, even when God calls you out of Babylon, out of your Babylon, to bring you back to where you are, you need to come back by faith. Because you'll come back to where God is calling you and you'll look around and the circumstances will look really bad. Like, why bring me back here? Well, he's bringing you back to certain places in order that you would do your first works over. And one of the patterns in the Old Testament, hear me now, child of God, because we are called to be temple centered, viewing people, people who understand the temple of the God, a uh, temple of God. God had destroyed the temple several times, did he not? He destroyed the tabernacle in Shiloh. He destroyed the temple uh, in 587 B.C. And Israel had to rebuild the temple. So when they came back, uh, Joshua, the high priest, and, and the rulers with them, along with Ezra, were called to clean up the land and reestablish the foundation and lay the cornerstone for the rebuilding of the temple. And you read of an event in, Ezekiel, in, Ze, in uh, uh, Ezra chapter 3, verse 10. Pull that up, please. Ezra 3.10. We're going to read Ezra 3.10 through 13. I'm going to show you a very interesting uh, scenario that will actually highlight my point that it is critically important that you and I don't be stuck in the past. Don't get stuck in the past. Here's what the text says. And when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple, this will be the second temple called the Ezrian temple. When the builders had laid the foundation to the temple, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinances of King David. Boy, we could take that and run with it because you see, anytime that you and I are doing anything for God, at every step of success, we should worship God and celebrate that God gave us grace to lay the foundation. We getting ready to build the church now. There ought to be joy going on, happiness, because we were in Babylon, no temples in Babylon, no sin synagogues in Babylon. We were in a strange land because God was whooping our butt no matter how long it took. But now we're back home. We get to lay the foundation. Thank you, Lord. 
That's called repentance. And here's the thing that we discover in verse 11, these words. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. And all of the people shouted with great shouts when they praised the Lord. Now that was a straight up Pentecostal worship service. Shouting, all the people shouting and, and praising God and getting their worship on. Wonderful thing is going on here. When they praise the Lord, because the foundation of the house was laid. Now, the only thing is laid is the foundation. But look at this next verse. It's going to teach us something. Here it is, verse 12. But many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers, these are the old folks, who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice. And the others shouted with a loud joy. You got the young people shouting for joy. You got the old people weeping for sadness. And the two mixture was going on at the same time. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. Ezra 313. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people for the shout of, uh, for the, for the people that shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. So you got this loud, jubilant noise going on by the younger people who didn't see the first temple. And you got the crying and the moaning and the groaning of the old people who did see the first temple. And the old people are making an estimation out of the carnality of history, the carnality of history, that the temple that is presently being built doesn't even remotely correspond to the temple that was built by Solomon. They were looking on things historically and they were looking on things carnally. They got trapped in the notion that they could tell how much weight and how much beauty and how much splendor would be uh, achieved in the building of the second temple by merely the external sign of the size of the cornerstone. What impeded the old people from rejoicing is they were living in the past. They were stuck on Solomon's temple. I don't have time, but Solomon's temple was bad. That thing was bad. I mean, that was funky. I mean, that was, that was, that was the tabernacle 3.0. And I mean, it was large. And what the old people were seeing now would be equivalent to a person having a beautiful five bedroom home, 4,000 square feet, three car garage, three levels, and a backyard that's an acre or two in size compared to a three bedroom home, one car garage, and really only about a quarter of an acre in the backyard. And the old people are saying, we have diminished in our glory. Do you know God had to correct them? He had to show them that they were walking by sight and not by faith. He had to show them that they were stuck in history instead of being stuck on God's history, instead of understanding that God is on the move, that God is moving, and that a trajectory moving forward always has the potential of greater glory than anything that God had done in the past. This is the problem that was going on at that time. So let's just work through our points because I'll show you that here in our third point. A reputation alone is not reality. Living in the past is not living. Looking backwards while going forward is a denial of faith. I love the way uh, uh, and Angelo kind of hinted at it. Listen to uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 13 and 14. I want you to capture this principle as we get ready to deal with our third sub point. You guys have heard this before. Paul understood the importance of a forward-looking faith and how important it is not to be tethered by the past. He knew it. And this is how he lived. This is how Paul lived his life. And, and child of God, just for the record, the apostle Paul accomplished way more than the other apostles because he never got stuck on his Jewishness. He never got stuck on being a Hebrew. 
He never got stuck on the promised land. He didn't ever get stuck on the earthly temple or the earthly system or the earthly inheritance. He never got stuck. In fact, he intentionally cut the cords of his past every day so he could press toward the mark of the high calling of God, which was in Christ Jesus. Listen to what he says. Brethren, I do not count myself as to having apprehended. Of course, we have not. And we won't any of us until we do all together. He says, but one thing I do do, I know how to forget yesterday. I know how not to get stuck in the past. I know how not to be deluded by things that do not have a reality in the basis of what constitutes real life. See, because as a Hebrew and as a Pharisee, he was stuck in the past. I'll talk about it with you guys again in the Revelation as we deal with Revelation chapter 13 and 14. Paul's legacy goes all the way back to the Maccabean Maccabean period where the uh, Maccabean family were very strong and very zealous and very powerful and very given to the promises of God for the Hebrew people. That's what a Pharisee is. He was nothing but a Neo-Maccabean and his job was to kill anybody that stopped them from worshiping Torah and living as God wanted them to live in the promised land. And here comes Jesus and he blessed blows that whole thing up. Jesus blows the whole thing up. He blows the whole thing up. And you know how Paul was when he was stuck in the past? He was stuck in the past and he became a murderer, didn't he? He became a blasphemer. He became a criminal because he was stuck in the past. And when the true and the living God and the person of Christ who had died and was buried and rose again and has power over death and his love for his elect whom Paul was persecuting knocked Paul down on the Damascus road and showed Paul that he was the reality of life. Paul eventually by the revelation of God realized that he was not living at all. He was not living at all. He was angry, but he wasn't living. He was mad, but he wasn't living. He was zealous, but he wasn't living. He was persecuting people, but he wasn't living. He was religious, but he wasn't living. He was religious, but he wasn't living. Until he met the living Lord himself and the humility of the power of the gospel to break him from the past, he wasn't living. And I suppose that for those three days that he was in that house on that street called Straight, He got his doctrine right, and that is the gospel is all about now and the future. The gospel is about looking forward to the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes or when we go to him. And once Paul got turned around, he became the greatest advocate of forward-thinking, redemptive reality that the world has ever known. It's very important for you and I not to get stuck right here where we are. Y'all understand what I'm saying, child of God? Here's the reason why. He says in verse 14, no, let me just read 13. Go back to 13 and I'll finish with 14. He says in verse 13, Philippians 3, 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And if you were to be sensitive to the grammar there, he says, I exert every kind of energy I possibly can to make sure the extremities of every one of my limbs is going forward. I exert every possible extremity I can to keep myself thinking about what's in front of me. That's amazing. He says, I labor hard not to start sliding down the hill back into the past, getting trapped by reputation. He says, I fight against it. I toil against it in myself and with others. Because see, here's the truth. Other people will also try to trap you in the past. Please, you know what I'm talking about. When your friends or your relatives and your loved ones see you, the immediate thing that they want to do is take you back 500 years, take you back 30 years, take you back 40 years, because they want to define you according to their own vision of who you are. Can y'all, will y'all hear me for a moment? They don't know you. They don't know you. They, nobody can know a child of God but God. No one can discern you but the true and the living God, particularly in the moment in which you live. The spiritual man cannot be discerned by the natural man. The natural man looks at you and he says, hey, just man, remember the days we used to boogaloo? And I go, no. I've been pressing forward so long, I forgot. 
I'm going to give some lessons, a little bit about the blessing of looking backwards, but the problem is being trapped. Don't ever get defined by where you were. Don't ever get defined by where you were. There's no life in where you were. And remember the God that gave his placard to us in that trifold expression in the book of Revelation in verses 5 through 11. Verse 3, he says, I am the God who is and who was and who is to come. He covers all of the span of time. Time is past, present, and what? Future. So I'm the God right now. Oh yeah, I'm the God from yesterday, but I'm the God right now, and I'm the God to come. And that's how the child of God has to live. In the reality of where we are now, we can benefit from the past. We'll talk about that, but we're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. Sub, third sub point, I just want you to capture this. To be stuck in the past while going forward is a denial of faith because it's a failure to see the glory of God. It's a failure to see God's glory. I'm going to tell you what the problem is. When you and I do not see God's glory out in front of us, we collapse into either being stuck in the moment or regressing to history. Listen how the Hebrew writer puts it in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, start at verse 13. <clears throat> now listen how the Hebrew writer says it. And the people of the Hebrews are really the people of whom we are learning a lot about in the book of the Revelation because they are the ones that God is saying you better not collapse back into that Antichrist system called Judaism. You who are true believers... That temple is not where you want to go. The temple is backwards. The temple is history. The priesthood, the Levitical priesthood is history. The sacerdotal system of, of the blood of bulls and goats is history. All that's under God's anathema. Don't go back there. That thing is about to get blown up. That's the way of the exhortation to the church uh, of the Hebrew people. And this is why he gets to that, that hall of faith in Hebrews 11 and says these words. These all died in faith. Not having received the promise. That's how I want to die, don't you? I want to die in faith. These all died in faith. But having seen them afar off, see the nature of faith, it sees things afar off. It sees it. And it sees it's way out there. This is how you live. There's nothing more glorious than an old person laying on their deathbed, knowing that they're about to cross over into glory, and you can see vividly, not only in their eyes and in their words, but in the passion of their heart, that they are looking forward to what's in front of them. And not opining and complaining and murmuring about wanting to live a few more years on this earth. Nothing is more glorious than meeting a saint who's ready to go. Nothing is more edifying to the soul than to meet a child of God on his or her deathbed and saying, Pastor, I'm ready. I'm ready to meet my Lord. I'm ready to see him. Nothing is more wonderful in ministry than to meet a saint that's ready. And I say it's a failure to see the glory of God that keeps you and I stuck on the past. Listen to the language. <clears throat> And they were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed them that they were what? Strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, the way you know you are a stranger and pilgrim on the earth is because you see something afar off. You're persuaded of it. And you confess it. And you embrace it. And you run after it. So if you and I are called to be pilgrims and called to be strangers, we ought to be living like it. There are going to be a value system that we have that's different than the world. There's going to be a set of attitudes and perspectives on calamity that's going to be different from the world. It's going to be evident to the world that we hold the world's goods loosely. And then, what's with you? Why are you not tripping? I, don't you see what I see? No, you don't. And that becomes the problem. The child of God sees something afar off that frees him up, extricates him, liberates him from the traps that would try to define him by the moment. It's failure to see the glory of God is described by the Hebrew writer in verse 12, verse 14 and 15. Watch. For they that say such things declare plainly that they are what? Seeking a country. Look at verse 15. Watch this, child of God. And truly, if they have been, here's our word, mindful of that country. What country are we talking about? That country going back to Egypt. 
going back to Egypt. And truly, had they been mindful of that country that God delivered them out of, that house of bondage, that system of slavery, that place of darkness, of idolatry, and nothing but cruel experience, had they been mindful. What do you mean, Pastor Mark? Their mind is on it. Their heart is on it. They are secretly resonating with what it was like in their old carnal fleshly life. Now watch what the Hebrew writer says about that kind of thinking. Because this is going to give you an analysis of some people who don't continue in the faith. One, comp one critical component of persevering in the faith is you not allowing yourself to spend any secret time catering to and nurturing past things. Listen to it. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had an opportunity to have returned. Woo! Lord, deliver me from that kind of mindfulness. But the truth be told, and God knows this for all of us, there have been times that we have walked on the edge of going back and only by the grace of God did he, did he keep you from crossing over into those patterns. And you realize how evil your heart is, how simple you are, how prone to want to just taste the waters of history. Go back for a minute, just for a moment and, and enjoy that. And if it wasn't for the spirit of the living God as the candle searching the innermost parts of your being and cutting the light on on that depravity and showing it for how sinful it is and how demonic it is so that your soul says, Lord, no, Lord, no, I don't want to go back there. I don't want to go back because many people got let's go back. Many people got let's go back. That's Hebrews 6 and 10. Once enlightened, once having tasted of the heavenly gift, once having enjoyed the word of the living God. That's Hebrews 10. After that, they have word, heard the word of the knowledge of the gospel of the once for all sacrifice for sins. They didn't return back to works religion. Doing this and doing that and handling this and handling that and being defined by Sabbath keeping or by works or by speaking in tongues or by baptism or by all of the emblems that were only support basis for getting you to the substance, which is Jesus. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I understand what. And the other thing I'm going to tell you as we get ready to work through our final points. Walking by faith in the gospel. Is hard. It's hard. Walking by faith in Christ requires a radical courage. Do you understand what I just stated? It requires a radical courage. See, for God, is he knows. This is why. See, Jesus knew many in Sardis were collapsing. See, see he, he knew that they were in the same place geographically, but they had gone back to Judaism in their heart. And many people will come to church and hear the message, but the message will not resonate anymore. Do you know why? In their heart, they've gone back to Egypt. And that's a real challenge for us when we are not nurturing a forward thinking mentality. When you don't see that city whose builder and maker is God in front of you. Listen to verse 16. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. There it is. There it is. Now, these are the people who persevered, even though they were persecuted. These are the people who kept moving forward, even though they were driven out. These are the people who lived in the dens and in the rocks and in the mountains and wore sheepskin and goatskin. These are the people that were rejected by society and persecuted all over the place. But they were persuaded that there was a better city than the city of Babylon, than the city of Satan, than the city of the wicked one. Persuaded. They did not receive the mark of the beast or the number of his name or his name. And they were willing to die for Christ's sake because they were persuaded of a better city. See, these were forward moving people because they were operating out of a living faith. Am I making some sense? Point number three, because we've seen it. 
A reputation alone is not reality. Living in, the, living in the past is not living. Looking backwards while going forward is a denial of faith. It is a failure to see the glory of God. Point number three, rather. Assess the condition and face the truth. I love you, Lord. Now watch what he does. Over in verse two, the Lord said, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Now, we got a little work to do. This is why I said what I'm going to do is just deal with part of our text and come back uh, next week because his promises are just magnificent. But what I love about the Lord is <clears throat> what he says to the church of Sardis is you got a bunch of work to do. Now, strategically, he lays out how to actually begin the process of overcoming the deception of believing that you're alive when you're dead. OK, he, he says this is the way you do it. You look at that first uh, imperative. Verse two. Part A, be watchful. Do you see that? Literally, it means to wake up. Wake up! Wake up! Because you have drifted into a kind of sleep that allows you to believe that reputation is equivalent to life. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up, assess the condition and face the truth. He says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. So he said, on the one hand, that you're dead. He wasn't talking about absolutely everybody per capita in the church at Sardis. He was saying there are elements in your ministry. There are some people that are spiritually dead as an overall aggregate. You are not healthy at all. That if you were, uh, if the analogy of a plant was depicting who the church at Sardis was, when you looked at that plant, you say, I'm not buying that plant. That plant is dead. And reality, you guys do know that plants can have a lot of dead elements to it that look so bad that you write it off as dead and yet that plant is still alive. But what you would have to do is really go to work to cultivate new life in that plant. And that's what Christ is saying here. And I'm so glad that right now at Grace, we are not in a condition where this particular indictment is necessarily true. Don't, don't think that I'm being presumptuous, but as a pastor, I always work with these seven categories in the book of the Revelation about any local church, including ours. Because in my mind, I have a lot of churches that I know. And I look at all of our churches, our churches in the north, our churches in the south, our churches in, 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 the, um, in the islands, in the Virgin Islands, our churches in Mexico, our churches in Africa. There are a lot of our brothers and sisters that I know, and I get the uh, information around the condition of their churches, right? And a lot of them look up to grace. And they look up to grace because God has actually been good to us, whether we want to admit it or not. After all these years, as raggedy as we are in so many ways, yet God has been good to us. And in a lot of the congregations that I do know, they are suffering extremely uh, difficult challenges, whether challenges in, in leadership or whether challenges in polity in the congregation or whether challenges in their cultural situation with a lack of jobs so that they're starving to death and all kind of situations. When they look at grace in Hayward, in California, in the United States, and they see basically what we're up to, they're thankful for who we are. And this is where also one of the secrets of being able to keep it moving is contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Because one of the reasons the children of Israel were making their way back to Egypt in their heart is because they were not able to assess all the good that God had given them. And one of the traps the enemy will get you on when he's messing with your head to get you to go backwards is he'll cause you not to see all the blessings that you have presently in your life that God has given you. And when you and I are constantly complaining and, and murmuring about what we don't have or what we used to have, then we are denying the God of glory who is a very present help in time of need for what he is providing right now. It is equivalent to the children of Israel in the wilderness when God would feed them with the manna in the morning and then with the fried chicken in the evening. And then they get cold water every day as they made their way through the wilderness. God provided for them, didn't he? And yet they were constantly saying, can God uh, furnish a table in the wilderness? They were constantly wanting to go back. And I'm saying to us, you and I don't want to get trapped in history. We want to be able to assess where we are and count our blessings. I am so thankful for what God has done for me up to this very moment. 
I'm so thankful for what God has done for me. I labor really hard to overcome covetousness. Why? Because with food and raiment, be there with content. Thank you. And the same thing I'm speaking spiritually about the church. There is always a need to aspire to things, to continue to grow, continue to develop, continue to progress. I'm going to read an article on that. Now, but it's something different when you are aspiring to acquire and aspiring to grow and aspiring to mature than coveting that and complaining where you are. Y'all understand the difference? You, you work toward certain goals because God gives us the liberty to do it. But you don't live in the moment opining as if somehow you don't have anything because you will never achieve future things until you have mastered contentment where you are. I can tell you that now. You will never achieve future things until you can master the contentment of where you are. Because see here, Future and present is really only distinguishable by our uh, linear thinking in terms of who we are. God is omnipresent. What that means is if I can enjoy God right now in all the fullness of his sufficiency, all the plenary of his blessings in my life right now, he knows he can trust me for future things. He can trust me for tomorrow if he can find me content today. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So assess the condition and face the problem. Let's make uh, uh, two observations under our sub points. All relationships need maintenance. Can I get an amen? All relationships need maintenance. <laughs> All relationships need maintenance. I love this because even in God's church, he has chosen in his economy. I love him. The Lord is good. Now, the Lord could have made it. Y'all got time for me? The Lord, y'all got to go to work and you go visit folks? Okay. The Lord could have made it where um, when he saved us, like he could have just made it where he just kept dumping blessings on us all the way to glory. Right? I mean, we're saved by the grace of God. We're the righteousness of God in Christ. In God's eyes, we have no sin. In God's eyes, we are perfectly righteous. Not only have we in God's eyes obeyed all of God's law, we have obeyed it permanently and perfectly for all eternity in Christ. Y'all got that? I mean, so that God would be justified upon saving you to just pour out blessings every day and he'd be able to condemn the mouth of any wicked man against you as to why he blessed you like he blessed Job. Because of who you are in Christ the goodness and grace of God in Christ. He could just open up that big heaven of pinata and just drop it on you. And every day you could be just living so large in Jesus that the only thing you could say to everybody that you see is I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And it would simply be true, except in your soul, except in your relationship with God. Except in the, in the areas in which God is most concerned with your sanctification, with your growth, and with your fellowship with him. Christ and the Father and the Holy Ghost are way more concerned with our communion with them than the material things he gives us. He's way more concerned about that. And to that end, he just won't give us serpents for fish and stones for bread. That's the economy of sanctification in the life of the people of God. If he has to give us trouble for us to draw near to him, that's what he's going to feed us. And he's going to be happy with his sheep right up against his leg. Then running around way out there yonder in the field, fat, happy, and then trip up on a rock and find ourselves on our back. And you know once the sheep is on his back, he can't get back on his legs again. And so far from the shepherd that the wolf says, that stupid sheep. Man, I'm getting ready to have me some lamb chops tonight. And that's what happens when sheep get way out there too far on the limb of the carnal material blessings that God gives us. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of us have been there. And so he says, 
maintenance is necessary. This is Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. I'm in keeping with the analogy of the return to the temple and the rebuilding of the temple. <clears throat> Ezra has already had the account where they have reestablished the temple foundation. Now Nehemiah's job is to rebuild the gates because you've got to have walls around the city. Whenever you buy some property, you've got to put boundaries around that property. And God has put boundaries around his property. And Nehemiah's job was to build the wall. But before he could build the wall, you know what he had to do? Assess the condition. What is Christ doing with the church at Sardis? Assessing the condition. Now here's what he says. Nehemiah says, I went up by night by the brook. That's Kedron. And I viewed the wall. That was his assignment, to rebuild the wall. <clears throat> and I turned back and I entered by the gate of the valley and then I returned. Here's the synopsis of his whole excursion around the wall. But look at the next verse. And the rulers knew not whether I went or what I did. Neither had I as yet told the Jews, nor the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. In other words, this was a mystery excursion on the part of Nehemiah. He didn't let anybody know. He had went out on his own and did a reconnaissance to see the real condition of Jerusalem and the wall. And now he comes to the leaders and listen to how he puts it. Verse 17. Then said I unto them. Now I want you to hear this. Because this is exactly what Christ is saying to the church at Sardis, who has already come to the church at Sardis, walked throughout the church, seen its condition, understand its peril, understand its plight, and is ready to now let the church at Sardis know, do you see the distress that you are in? See it? You see it? Then said he unto them, ye see the distress? that we are in, watch this, how Jerusalem lies waste and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Any of y'all tracking with me in the Revelation study? Raise your hand. Any of y'all tracking with me? And the fire is coming down, right? And the fire is coming down and it shouldn't be coming down on God's people. But when we rebel against God and make God our enemy, he's going to be our enemy. When we make God, when we are God's enemy, he's going to let us know we can't whip him. And, Jer and, and, and Nehemiah is saying to the people that have been there for a decade now, do you see this mess? Now watch this. There are, there are times when you and I are in a situation and we don't see it as we ought to see it. And that's what's going on with the church at Sardis. Jesus has to show up with a letter and say, y'all don't see. You don't see how bad your condition is. You don't see. You, you somehow are living in a fictitious world of the gates all being nice and, and, and orderly and organized and healthy and strong and painted. He says, Jerusalem's a mess. And here's his word. Come and let us what? Build up the wall of Jerusalem that we may be no more reproach. Isn't that what Christ is saying? Strengthen the things that remain. Strengthen the things that remain. Sometimes in the uh, management work of a relationship, we will recognize that things are dead. Sometimes we have to let them go. Don't have time. Sometimes we have to let them go. But there will be other areas in the relationship that we will recognize are weak. You know what you got to do? Go to work to strengthen them. You got to find the areas in the relationship that's weak and you go to work to strengthen it. If you care about the relationship, am I making some sense? Right. And this is where our Lord Jesus Christ is as he's dealing with the church at Sardis as well. Nehemiah is a representation of the spirit of God bringing to the leadership of the church the awareness that the leadership had fallen asleep and allowed the church to become so raggedy that they were living on reputation. He says, wake up, wake up. Strengthen those things that remain. Sub so point B. Having said in uh, point number three, assess the condition and face the truth. All relationships need maintenance. Sub so point B. God is in the business of what? Upgrading. I know that sounds extremely contemporary, but it's true. God is in the business of upgrading. I'm going to make sure you get this true. Upgrading has been what God has been doing since humanity failed upgrading because in the coherence of his of what we call biblical theology or the trajectory of redemptive purpose God already sees the end from the beginning he knows what the project is going to look like when it's done doesn't he 
in his care for human beings throughout the history of redemption, God naturally allows things to wear down and then he enters in to revive. And in the revival, what he does is add revelation. We start at the fall of Adam and Eve, and the first thing that God implements is the necessity of sacrifices. That was your native expression of worship. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. God is a holy God. A man shed man's blood. By man shall his blood be shed. Jesus Christ becomes the propitiation for our sin. We worship God in Christ, even if it's as basic as a bunch of rocks you put down on the ground. You go get that bullock, slit his throat, put the blood down and uh, an offering to God, and then put that bullock on that altar and let him be consumed as a burnt offering, as a substitute for your sin, typically in Jesus Christ. God is honored. God is honored. That's the way Abel did it. That's the way Daddy Noah and, and Mama Eve did it. Brother Cain came along and says, I got a new thing coming on. That's why fire came down and got him. Right? But all the saints worship God at the altar with a substitute and blood. And that thing got larger and larger in terms of God's upgrade. He upgraded it to a tabernacle with the children of Israel in the wilderness. And then he upgraded it to Solomon's temple. Right? 967 B.C. And then he upgraded it with Ezra's temple. And then he upgraded it with Herod's temple, which is where the Lord came into. And Herod's temple was so big, it was still in building. I'm going to talk about that here in a moment. It was so big, it was still in building. And then he upgraded it from earthly temple to heavenly temple. Because when Christ died on the cross, he ended that pattern of temples being built and temples being destroyed. Temples being built and temples being destroyed. Temples being built and temples being destroyed. Anybody walking with me? He upgraded us in Jesus Christ to a temple that could never be destroyed again. But the temple that Christ now is building, which is the church on earth and the church in heaven, is still having the li lively stones placed in it until the last lively stone is placed in, and then Christ is going to consummate everything. But there's no destroying of this temple anymore. Y'all hear what I'm saying? There's no destroying. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. And that's what God has been doing now for the last 1987 years, building his church as an upgrade system of that great fundamental truth that he has said, and the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and he will be their God and they will be my people. That's the way eternity comes into being. And this is what we're learning in our text as well. God is in the business of upgrading. You would agree with that? Ezra chapter 5 verse 1. Notice what it says in Ezra 5 1. And then Ezra 5, 2, Ezra 5, 1, then the prophets, Haggai, uh, then the prophets, Haggai, the prophet, Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and in Jerusalem in the name of God, the God of Israel, even unto them. Pastor, why are you using that verse? Because upgrade always require men and women who know how to prophesy, who know how to preach, who know how to teach, who know how to exhort the people of God to keep it moving. This is where the upgrade comes. Edification comes in the preaching and the teaching and the exhortation of the word of God. Upgrade comes when you and I are given by grace the ability to see the mess that we're in. And somebody come along and tell you it can be fixed. We can fix this. The grace of God is abundant in Christ Jesus. It might be broken. It can be fixed. It might be wounded. It can be healed. It might be torn down. It can be built back up. Are y'all used to that kind of exhortation? You ought to be. The fundamental nature of the gospel is edification. The fundamental nature of redemption is that God comes to us and says it's paid for. In other words, there is no sin in the life of the people of God that can't be dealt with, put away, and God upgrade. Sometimes he'll allow it to get blown up just to upgrade it. He'll let your life get really bad just to upgrade it. And the upgrade of the people of God comes from preaching and teaching. Let me just be presumptuous about where we are in our present situation with the COVID virus, can I? I mean, this is a really kind of funky situation for all intents and purposes. It really is. I mean, it's not normal sociologically. It's not normal relationally for us to have to be six and eight feet from each other with mask on and gloves. We can't do that for the rest of our lives. I, you just can't do that. 
We would fall apart. We would go crazy. And the enemy would be working to, to, to destroy that healthy social bond that we need in order to love one another. He'll be able to create among us little autobonds like little autonomous robots who are inclined then to hear voices of loveless instruction to cause us now to be suspicious of one another because we got all this distance going on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I don't even want to go there. I was at the flea market, not flea market, farmer's market about three weeks ago. And I'm confessing my sin right now. I just want to just share with you. And I'm, I'm going to get some donuts and I'm, uh, some, some sweets. And I'm in the line, right, with everybody six feet away. And uh, I don't wear a mask outside. I, I just don't. I don't have time to tell you how stupid it is. If I, I'm just, all right, so I wear it when I have to go inside. But outside, I'm breathing fresh air. All right. And I get up to the stand and I'm by a lady. She's about five feet, 11 and three quarter inches away. <laughs> And she's got a mask on. She says, sir, do you know what the standard is here? Six feet, you can't be near six feet. And I ignored her while I was talking to the lady about some bread I wanted to purge. And then she said it again. Sir, did you hear me? I said, shut up. I said, shut up. Right. And you know what she did? She shut up. And everybody around her relaxed because that lady was creating a panic. She was intentionally creating a panic like just this neurotic old chick that wanted to be the police of everybody around. I said, shut up. All right. And the, the, the lady that was serving me was happy. And <laughs> The point is, is that that kind of person would be the person that will work for the government and spy on you and have you get a ticket over something that we don't actually know is a real prudent law in the first place. It's really important for us to understand uh, where we are in our, in our lives and particularly now. Here's what I want to say about that example that I gave. As I think about the uh, COVID situation, my prayer is that when we come out of this, when we come out, there will have been in our spirit and in our attitude an upgrade. Amen. Amen. A greater understanding, a greater clarity, a greater purpose, a, a triumphant sort of gospel redemptive interpretation of the past so that we can live more effectively for the glory of God. My, the sadness of my heart is I know that it's not going to be the case with some people. Some of our people are going to be like, they're going to be like plants that don't get enough oxygen. They're going to collapse. The analogy is that of the corona, uh, coronavirus. Older people who are more compromised, they do get sick and die. The younger people who are healthy, they don't get sick and die. The difference is between being healthy in your immune system versus not. And I'm praying that this trial that we are going through builds our immune system, upgrades our immune system, makes us much more spiritually strong to deal with spiritual viruses of every kind and not get weaker and more depleted and not be able to glorify God. I don't want to be a leaf shriveling up. I don't want to be a plant drooping over. I want to breathe air, oxygen. I want the sun coming down, the vitamin D working in me for me to glorify God in my bodies, which are his. I hope you understand that. And see, we need to hear the word of God. The, the prophets got to preach to us. They got to exhort us like Haggai did and Habak Habakkuk did. This is our text. Go to Haggai chapter 2, verse 2 through 9, because this is exactly what God was saying in the book of Haggai. This is what I meant by you can't be going forward looking backward, because in going forward looking backwards, here's the problem. It's a failure to see his glory. Here is how God answered that question. Look at what it says. Speak now to Zerubbabel the son of Shetiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jozadak, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, verse 3, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? This is the prophet speaking of the same subject back in Ezra. Notice what he says. And how do you see it now? That's my point. If you're living in the past, you can't see the glory of the present. 
How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison as nothing? See how they were trapped in the past? They couldn't even see what was happening in the present. Look at the next verse. Verse 5. Okay, verse 4. Yet now be what? Strong. That's called exhortation. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Jozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. Do you hear the exhortation? Be strong. Don't collapse. Don't fall apart. Don't give up. Don't say the former days were better than these. Go to work. Strengthen those things that remain. Verse 5. According to the word that I have covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Fear ye not. Look at God. Look at God. You know what he said? I have never left you. I didn't leave you in all your crazy, stupid, sinful ways. Coming out of Egypt, I didn't leave you when you were in the wilderness acting a fool sinning against me over and over and over and over and over again. I was with you all that time. I was with you when you went into the land of Canaan and tore it up every day of the week worshiping all those pagan idols and getting so crazy as it was in the book of Judges. I was with you when your kings divided the land and, and built gods uh, of calf, golden calves. I was with you when I sent your butt into Babylon. I was with you all those 70 years. I was with you when you made your way back 800 miles from Babylon back to Jerusalem. I've been with you all this time. I ain't never left you. I have never left you. I have never left you. You might have thought I left you. I've never left you. I'm not a God that lies. I'm not a God that changes. I don't fail. My promises are good. I'm going to have a people that glorify me. Now that's what he's saying right here. That's what he's saying right here. According to the word that I covenant with you. Verse 6. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yes, yet once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Y'all may not know what's going on there. He's talking about the new covenant. He's talking about the days in which Christ came. He's talking about blowing up Judaism, blowing up that old system. He's talking about that first Pentecost where Christ had risen from the dead and then went on high and sent the Holy Ghost and drew 17 nations to him to hear the gospel in their own language and from that day all the way through the book of Acts the Holy Ghost and the kingdom of God and the apostles are establishing the kingdom and the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ and he was building his church during all that time shaking up Judaism establishing the kingdom of God with the Lord Jesus Christ at the helm. That's what he's saying. And that word was given to Haggai 400 years before it happened. And then we saw it fulfilled in Hebrews chapter 13, right? The Hebrew writer already said, we haven't come to Mount Zion, uh, uh, Mount Sinai, we've come to Zion. We've come to a city that God has built and he's already shaking up everything. He's going to demolish and break down all the old historical yesterday patterns and bring us into the reality of Jesus Christ. And you and I have been in that reality again for 1987 years. Am I making some sense? Look at the next verse. Here it is. For thus saith the Lord, yet in a little while, yet once in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Verse 7. And I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall what? Who is the desire? Christ. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. I don't know if you see it, but I ain't waiting for that to happen because it already happened in A.D. 33. When the Lord went on high and sent the Holy Ghost and began to build his house and he called Saul into it. And he's been calling men and women from every nation into it up to this hour. I'm in that house right now. Are you in that house? I'm in the house of the latter glory of the God man, Jesus Christ, of whom the Holy Ghost is bearing witness all over the world that God is building a temple for his own glory in Jesus Christ. We are the upgrade. We are the upgrade. We are the upgrade. Thank you, Lord. We are the upgrade. We are the upgrade. We are the upgrade. So, sub point three, uh, sub, uh, point number three, assess the condition and face the truth. Let's look at point number four so I can close it down. A lot to say. Just one more thing. This unfinished business thing that we need to deal with. 
Number four, unfinished business is disobedience to Christ. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter two, verse uh, Revelation chapter three, verse two, uh, the latter part. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Do you see that? Now, that's the line that we have to close with. It might seem strange the way Christ puts it. But it needs to be looked at carefully. What Christ is basically saying to you and me in this text, as he's saying to the church of Sardis, is I actually see the end of your labors before you do them. And I'm letting you know that where you are right now in your task, you will not complete your job. I actually see the end of your labors right now. And I can tell you right where you are right now, your, your work will not be completed. With the attitude that you have and with the trajectory that you're on, you won't complete your works. And where a person doesn't complete his work, he must necessarily ask the question whether or not he's in the work in the first place. Now, I, I don't mean to get up under this text in terms of a simple language with a, a theology that satisfies your understanding of who we are in Christ. I just want to develop this briefly and then we're going to shut it down and pick it up next week because you really need to hear someone who can actually see your destiny. Someone who can see your end. Now, if I tell you uh, I've looked at your works and I find them, you know, uh, 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 imperfect are not perfect, I mean, you can blow me off because you can tell me, do you know what tomorrow may bring? And I have to say no. Do you know what God can do between now and when my assignment is really up? And I have to say no. I don't have the ability to tell you that your work is imperfect, but the one who can see the end from the beginning can. And he will use that tool to help cultivate in us a change of attitude. So as to get us moving in a direction so that we can finish our work to which he has called us to do. Remember, God has all called us to a work. And he's called us to finish that work. I'm just going to make a few observations and close right here. So in Proverbs 11 verse 3, we made this our New Year's theme a couple years ago. Two years ago. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, right? Proverbs 3. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. The perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. And we said the integrity of the upright is what? The spirit of the living God that operates in the life of the people of God to guide them to glory. Well, I told you also that that Hebrew term integrity also means to accomplish or to finish. That the derivative of this word here, uh, tama, uh, thumam, is where we get in the Hebrew term perfection or completion. And integrity always means that which is what? Whole or complete. And when you follow your Bible carefully, one thing you know about God is that when he starts something, he finishes it. And that the people of God who are identified with God have an assignment. We all do. And God's purpose for us is that we accomplish our assignment. And where we are lacking in our process, God will let us know. Where we have been diverted or distracted by things that are not good, that have taken us off our course, he will let us know. Because every believer is left here as a witness and we are left here until our assignment is up. And when our assignment is up, we get to say with Moses, we get to say with Joshua, we get to say with Solomon, we get to say with David, we get to say with Jesus, we get to say with Paul. I've run my race. I've fought my fight. I finished my course. That is the glorious reality of every redemptive event in Scripture. That when God calls you to an assignment, his purpose is to work with you until it is finished. And it's his mercy to let us know in the midst of that project where we just are messing up. This is mercy. This is mercy. This is mercy. 
I'll give you one antithetical or what we would call a, a contrasting example. And that's Hezekiah. God had to put him into a sickness to let him know he was messing up. Because he had got settled on his leads. He got shaken out of that stupor. And so my point is, is that here what our Lord is doing in this, and this will be very simple for you as we close it down. Unfinished business is disobedience to Christ. So point A, integrity is the discipline of starting and what? Finishing. Genesis 2.1. Genesis 2.1. Y'all heard it before. I love this. Thus the heavens and the earth were what? Finish. All the host of them. God finished his work. He worked six days and on the seventh day he what? Rested from all his works which he had did. It became a pattern. It became a pattern. Deuteronomy 31, 24. I love this. Watch this. You know what Moses was called to do? To write the, the Decalogue, the Pentateuch. And you know what the text says in Deuteronomy 31, 24? Listen to it. Deuteronomy 31, 24. Listen to what he says about Moses. Y'all may have never known this. Moses was assigned to write the five books. And watch what the text says. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end. See that little phrase, made an end? Finished. When he had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were what? Finished. Moses started with Genesis 1-1. And he closed with Deuteronomy. He finished his work. You know what else Moses finished? The building of the tabernacle. The scriptures are explicitly clear that Moses finished that tabernacle and that tabernacle had a beautiful reality. That's sub point B. All of God's faithful servants understand this. Look at Exodus 39, 32. Exodus 39, 32. Exodus 39, 32 lays out the finishing of the tabernacle. I think the tabernacle took several months to uh, start and finish, but listen to it. Thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, what? Finished. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded them, so did they. Do you think God was happy with that? He was so absolutely happy when the finish, the tabernacle was finished, the Holy Ghost came down, filled that place up so that the priests couldn't minister. God loves finished things. Do you know Noah was given an assignment to build an ark in 100 years? Do you know what the Bible says? He finished it. And on the same self day that he finished it, God told him to get his family and, and, and children and to go inside the ark. And God closed the door on the ark when it was finished. Finishing becomes a critical principle for all of us. We could do many examples, but I'll just give you uh, one more example. And you have already seen, we talked about the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy 4. But hear it for yourself in the God man, John chapter 19, 30. You heard it before, hear it again. Here's our master hanging on the cross as the redemptive payment for all of God's reconciling work. Here he is hanging on the cross, personifying the payment for our sins, for our guilt, for our rebellion, for our salvation, for our eternity, for our sanctification, for our security, for our success in the gospel, for our failures. Here's the, here is the payment itself for everything that all the people of God are called to do. This is the payment. This here is what we call the tetelestai. In, in, in early Greek culture, you know what that was? That was a receipt that was placed publicly on the billboard to let everybody know the debt was totally paid for that particular person who owed that debt. When that debt was paid, nobody could argue because they could see the receipt. No one can argue with God in heaven, and they don't because God did close the courtroom. But no one should be able to argue with you if you see the receipt for your sins paid in the person of Christ. Do y'all see that? He finished his work in order for us to finish our work. Look at it. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. All of God's people have been called to a work. Once they have finished their work, they are done. What Christ is saying to the church that's in front of them is that he has been able to see the end from the beginning and because their works are not measuring up to that for which he has ordained them, he now has to come in and warn and admonish them. Warn and admonish them to realize that unfinished business is disobedience to Christ. I don't know who we may be talking to today in terms of uh, this admonition, but what I do know is that 
You and I know whether or not we are on course. You, you know individually, I know individually, we all know whether or not we are on course. And if we don't know, all we have to do is pray about it. Lord, show me where I uh, am distracted. Show me where I'm pretending. Show me where I have slipped into becoming fond of the past and denying the reality of his presence now in my life. Show me. Because I don't want to be deluded. I don't want to be deceived. And that really is the exhortation here. And if he shows you, if he happens to show you, then, then do what is basically laid out in verse 2, which in his loving admonition, we are all called to do. Strengthen those things that remain, which are ready to die. That's all. Strengthen those things which remain. Verse 3, remember therefore how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. That's all. Now that's what we're going to come back to next week and deal with the, the grace to be able to look at Actually, in this context, the past. Because what Christ would be calling us to do is repent. And in order to repent, you got to look backwards, don't you? So as I was saying in our previous articles, in previous commentary, that looking backwards is a dangerous thing when you are trapped. But it's necessary to look backwards. So I'll give you three observations and we'll close. One is, it's important to look at yesterday. It's not in your outline. But just think this through. It's important to look at yesterday, but what it requires in looking at yesterday is the discipline of objective study or analysis. When you look back at yesterday, you want to try to be as objective about yesterday as possible so that you don't distort the facts. So you can truly learn from yesterday. This is how you and I learn anything in education through testimonials, do we not? Your Bible is a history book. And to the degree that we read this history book objectively, we can learn from it. Your life is a history book. My life is a history book. To the degree I can look back objectively and not distort the facts, I can learn from it. And I need to learn from it because if I'm going to adjust, I got to learn. Today requires the humility of subjective honesty. That means even right now, I have to look at myself and be honest. That's a subjective assessment analysis process that can be very difficult, very difficult. But if I'm a forward thinking individual, I've got to be honest about where I am right now. Because if I'm, if I'm not honest about where I am, I might have in my mind a trajectory of where I'm going, but I might be on a wrong course. And I'll wake up a year from now or two years from now somewhere that I never thought I would be because I was not keeping it real about where I am right now. I know it is. I know it is. And it's hard. It's hard because... A lot of us want to just let the plane fly itself and hope it lands on, on glory shores. We really do. We want to just hope that somehow, somehow we just let the plane fly and when it gets over paradise, I'm just kind of asleep with my parachute. Just open the hatch and drop me off the plane and let the parachute open automatically and wake me up as I'm descending down into glory. I don't know how I got here, but I'm so glad I got here. And nothing in the Bible tells us that we get into glory by accident. Tomorrow requires the optimism of a legitimate promise. Did y'all get that? Tomorrow requires the optimism of a legitimate promise. It requires you and I believing that the promises of God are yes and amen to them 
who love God. All things are working together for good to them that love God. It's a legitimate promise, but it's only a legitimate promise to the believer. This is walking by faith, operating bodily by love that is realized by life. Yesterday requires the discipline of objective study to learn. Today requires the humility of subjective honesty to truly see our condition, our state. Tomorrow requires the optimism of legitimate promises to drive us forward in a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why? Because we all have a work to do and a work to finish. Amen.